Good morning and welcome to this morning's webinar. I'm Richard Garside and I'll be hosting the discussion. Uh, I can see that uh, attendees are still uh, joining this event. Uh, it's, been, it's been a very popular event. I think we can have a lot of people here. Um, well, the subject of this morning's webinar is deplatforming or what's sometimes referred to as cancellation or, or cancel culture. Um, and in particular, it's a focus on deplatforming within universities and academia. And uh, we are having a particular focus on the events at the University of Essex in late 2019 and early 2020, involving our two guests, Rosa Freeman and uh, Joe Phoenix. Uh, but the problems of deplatforming are wider than these particular events and extend also beyond universities. Uh, the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies has itself um, faced deplatforming actions, uh, though this is hardly a good enough reason for why we might be hosting uh, this morning's webinar. As a charity that's engaged in public education, we recognise the important role that improved knowledge and understanding plays as a foundation for effective action to achieve meaningful change. And deplatforming, based on the disapproval of an individual's views or stances or research findings, gets in the way of this, because if we can't have sometimes difficult conversations and explore challenging areas, uh, then it's very difficult to see how knowledge production and improved understanding can happen. Now, we're going to start the discussion by looking particularly at the deplatforming activity at the University of Essex, um, again involving our two guests, Joe Phoenix and Rosa Friedman, uh, before moving on to a wider discussion of the meaning of academic freedom, uh, the role of knowledge production and uh, the public conversation, and just uh, thinking about and exploring uh, how these things interact. Uh, we're going to be using the Q&A function uh, to put questions and observations from the audience to our guests. So if you have a question or indeed just want to share an observation or raise a point, then please do use the Q&A function. And you can also upvote uh, questions or observations that you like, you think are particularly relevant. Uh, and broadly speaking, you know, the more thumbs up um, a question or observation gets, uh, the more likely it is that uh, that we'll be able to uh, to discuss that uh, during the course of this webinar. Uh, we are recording this webinar and uh, the, the video of the webinar will be available via our YouTube um, channel, uh, certainly if not today, then in the next few days, and you'll be notified uh, when it's available. So without further ado, uh, let's move on to the uh, to the discussion itself. So we have two guests uh, who are joining us this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, Joe Phoenix, who is holds the chair in criminology at the Open University. Joe's just waving there. And uh, Joe will, will be kicking off with uh, some reflections on, uh, on the title of this webinar itself. That's the first time I think we've had a webinar or an event where uh, actually to say it outright is an expletive. Uh, and Joe will be talking a bit about that and then reflecting on the events at Essex uh, in relation to the criminology uh, seminar that uh, she was invited to speak at. And then also Rosa Friedman, who's the Professor of Law, Conflict and Global Development at the University of Reading. And uh, Rosa is just joining us there. And uh, Rosa will be talking about her own experiences um, of, of deplatforming action related to um, Holocaust Memorial Week at the university in early 2020. And then we'll be moving on to a broader discussion and reflection on those events and what they say about the state of academic freedom and knowledge production. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Joe. Joe, do you want to start by maybe just reflecting on, on the title of the of the webinar and, um, and the context for that, and then we can think a bit about the, the webinar yeah. that you were involved in? It's um, when, when uh, we started talking originally about this particular conference, um, I thought that the title uh, was quite apt. Now, the title, is, as we'll find out a little bit later on, if uh, people know about the events that led up to my cancellation and blacklisting, you'll know that there was a violent and profane poster circulating on uh, the University of Essex's campus that had the words of the title on it um, and a cartoon image. 
Now, the reason I wanted to say something about this isn't so much the, I'm going to be expletive here, shut the fuck up bit, right? That's fairly self-explanatory, but the use of the word turf uh, and why I'm very happy that it's um, uh, asterisked out. Um, this word is highly contentious. Uh, when used against people, uh, it is highly defamatory um, and, uh, and, and upsetting. And it's a, a term of abuse similar to other racialized or uh, sexist types of terms of abuse. There is another manner in which it's used, and, that's, and I think it's a bad faith rendition, quite frankly. And that's when uh, people who are writing about so-called gender critical uh, academics refer to us as, in a descriptive manner, trans-exclusionary radical feminists or feminism. Um, there are so many problems with that uh, type of description, that I, I, and that's not the subject of this seminar, so I'm not going to go down that route. Um, I just want to acknowledge that the title itself, I keep looking at and I find it problematic, partly because in and of itself, it's the sort of thing that has been used against people like Rosa and myself, and indeed against Rosa and myself. Um, but it's really important to have it there to recognize the tone and the tenor in which people like ourselves are treated. Okay, that, that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so just thinking about the, the kind of rather febrile events uh, in December, 2019. Yeah. Um, uh, around your uh, your appearance or planned appearance at a criminology mm. seminar, kind of, you know, anyone who's familiar with academic, a fairly in itself, a fairly mundane event. Uh, you know, there's lots of academic seminars every day um, up and down the country and indeed across the world. And uh, these are normally fairly, um, you know, kind of uh, low profile, um, unexciting events, apart from for those who are actively participating. So just... Just tell us a little bit about the background of that. And oh, happily. Uh, in fact, the December 2019, not a lot of people know this, the 2019 seminar was a reschedule from a 2018 seminar. Um, I was due to give a seminar about child sexual exploitation and policy change. However, I managed to concuss myself that day. Um, and so Nigel and the Goodley folk at the University of Essex and the Centre of Criminology agreed for us to reschedule it for the following year, same time, same place, so that I could attend the sociology Christmas do. <laughs> that was, and, you know, as people will know in the academic world, we don't get paid for going around doing these things, but, you know, you get treated as a guest, you often get taken out. Um, and I know a lot of the people down at Essex, so I thought that would be marvelous. In the run up to that December 19 um, seminar, I had been doing some work uh, in Canada, looking at some of the complications uh, around self-identification policies imposed on the federal prison system over there from the point of view of prison officers. And I suggested that I could do um, a seminar on that. It's all very new research. It wasn't in the public domain at that point, uh, that I could do a piece of, I could do a seminar on that and actually kind of expand out to what some of those controversies around trans rights tell us about the state of criminology today, back then. Or I could do something on youth justice, or I could do something on uh, child sexual exploitation. And they asked for me to do something on uh, trans. Right. So everything was hunky-dory and okay until the morning that I was due to travel down to Essex. I was traveling by car. Uh, when I got alerted by uh, a member of Essex University, that there was some Twitter traffic going on, and in particular that an individual called Matt Lauder uh, was beginning to foment, for lack of better words, about my appearance on campus. Uh, he sent a series of tweets that were what can only be described as a bad faith interpretation of a talk I had given at WP UK or for WP, at Women's Place UK uh, a few months earlier. Anyway, uh, that was the, the, the beginning. And then what happened in very quick succession uh, was uh, apparently students started boycotting the Department of Sociology, started threatening to barricade either the seminar room or the university. I, I, ne I never knew which. Um, 
And uh, there were other things happening. It's blacked out in the Rheindorf Review, so I don't know what was happening, but some other things were happening. Um, and it was very clear to me that uh, Essex University was not in a position to ensure the safety or the security of myself or indeed anyone who was attending the seminar. Um, and so the director of the Centre for Criminology took the decision to cancel the seminar that day, or rather to postpone it um, so that it could be scheduled at a point when adequate and appropriate security could be put in place. However, a week later, um, or a few days later, the Department of Sociology decided to have an emergency meeting in which they heard from a deputation of students, uh, including a trans individual. Uh, and I believe they heard from the LGBT staff network as well, or, or the university network LGBT, uh, and in which the question of whether my presence um, would make uh, people feel unsafe was raised. Uh, I happened to know that people were uh, plowing through my Twitter feed uh, in that particular meeting. Uh, I was asked to supply a copy of my seminar notes um, before so that the department could assess whether the views were indeed transphobic or not. The result of that meeting was uh, that the department voted to blacklist me, um, never to invite me. So on the day, here's the irony. Um, on the day that I was on a train to London to give one of the Mannheim seminars, I believe you were there, Richard, I found out from the head of the sociology department that I was, quote, not welcome at Essex University. Right. So those were the events. They happened very, very, very quickly. Um, and uh, if you were to ask me what was my immediate reaction, I was unbelievably furious. Right. And I was unbelievably furious for two reasons, and then I'm, I'm going to pass the time over. Uh, I was unbelievably furious because I could not believe that somebody who has done the type of work that I've done in politically controversial um, areas and who has made an, a name, I mean, it's going to sound big, big headed, but who's made a name for myself by doing those both and analyses rather than either or, uh, that I got labeled as I did, right? That was one. It was like, wow, how did that happen? Then the second reason I was furious was because uh, in my mind, somebody's politics and whether they sign a Stonewall letter for or against doesn't factor at all in our academic work. That's almost like saying we can vet people according to which, uh, which policies they support or don't support in government. So from the very beginning, I saw this as an ethics problem and as a problem of academic freedom, and as a problem between in the line between activism and actual knowledge production. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That's really clear. Now, the title of your planned paper, just um, you may, I don't, you may not recall it now, I don't know, but uh, what was the uh, uh, I can't recall it <laughs> off the top of my the head. The subject of it was. Yeah, I beg your pardon. Yeah, so the subject of it was actually that kind of balancing act around trans rights uh, in contemporary criminal justice. But one of the things that I really, really wanted to explore was what this contest about uh, trans rights told us about the state of criminological knowledge. So I was, I was trying to set up the contest as in describe it and then treat that as a problem to be analyzed. But to do that, through the lens of looking at the problems of the, of the self-identification, changes around uh, prison placement policy towards self-identification. And this was, you know, a paper which was drawing in part on a sort of a detailed international collaboration uh, yeah. that, you'd, um, th that you were part of, which also resulted in peer review published articles. That's uh, quite right, um, yes. Uh, uh, I'm a second author, uh, Rose Ricciardelli from, um, Memorial University in Newfoundland uh, is the lead author and James Gaycheck, who was working with her um, at the time, is also one of the authors. And that paper does a very, very simple sociological analysis of what prison officers were telling us about what it's like to, to be responsible for safety and security in a prison 
uh, and deal with self-identification um, because you know and, and some of the audience may not know it's probably worth pausing for a second and, and just describing some of the challenge or not some one particular challenge um, when we talk about trans prisoners and particularly trans women uh, we can be talking about a range of different um, sociological categories, if you like. So we could be talking about individuals who have gone through all the medical and hormonal treatment, who have a position of a, a gender recognition certificate, and who are thereby legally women. But we can also be talking about people who have never undergone any medical interventions or hormonal treatments. They still possess a GRC. So they are, in effect, male-bodied individuals who are legally um, <clears throat> Or we can be talking about people who have not undergone any changes or possibly undergone changes, but don't possess the GRC. So they are legally men. Um, that huge variety of individuals um, is covered by that one term, trans. Now, when you give that huge variety of individuals to, you know, a first year prison officer uh, and say, OK, you're responsible for ensuring their safety and security, along with prison order, um, those first year, second year, third year, those young prison officer recruits uh, give you some very interesting data back. And what they actually turn around to say is this is really complex. We don't know how to keep any of these people safe and we don't know how to ensure that people who might be predatory might not be using the system uh, in order to access individuals that they they would predate if you like thank you thank you i mean i think really then you know i mean you've, you've highlighted really some of the complexities of this area and, and precisely why you know detailed sort of academic research and study and critical reflection and indeed uh, you know disputation um, and, and challenge is, is so important in, in such a fraught area. But I yeah. guess really, you know, one of the take home points from this, certainly in relation to, to your experiences, Joe, was that, you know, this is perfectly normal within academia. And I mean, it's very normal for people to engage in research, produce peer review research, and then attend academic seminars. And the fact that, uh, you know, in, in your particular case, uh, it seemed impossible for one of the leading uh, um, UK universities to hold that space for that in order, you know, for that to take place is itself something to perhaps which is worth reflecting on. And we'll, we'll come back to that, I think, uh, later in the discussion. It's important to bear in mind this is not a particularly big at University of Essex per se. You know, this is a problem that a number of universities and public institutions more broadly are wrestling with. Can I add um, one teeny tiny, tiny thing? Yeah, go on, and then within, we'll, we must move on to it. Yeah, within criminology, studying the unintended consequences of policies is normal. Thank you, beautifully put. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, so, so Rosa, um, thank you so much for giving your, your time this morning as well to talk about this. Um, so, again, I mean, the events that you got caught up in in, in early 2020, um, associated with some uh, speaking engagement uh, related to Holocaust uh, Memorial Week at Essex. And uh, I think it's one thing that's very clear from the Reindorf report, and we'll come back to that a bit later in this webinar, uh, was that the events that Joe was involved in were still very fresh in people's minds uh, when, when, uh, when, when your particular challenges and problems uh, emerged. So just tell us a little bit about, again, about the events uh, leading up to your attempted, the attempted deplatforming of you. And, and, and it, was, it was a quite a sort of a, an involved and complex, and indeed to this day, uh, a somewhat unclear uh, situation, wasn't it? So I've always had a, a close working relationship with the Human Rights Centre at Essex, with particular academics in the Human Rights Centre, um, because of my work on the UN and human rights, and because of how, how many of those academics either work in a similar area or are indeed UN special procedures mandate holders, which are sort of independent human rights experts. Um, I've attended many conferences there, and like Joe said, we, we don't get paid for these, but they've got a lovely hotel on campus. You get put up in a nice hotel and wined and dined, and, um, and they do really exciting research there. Um, I had spoken at Essex, um, I taught at their summer school, um, and spoken at Essex and taught on, on some people's modules. 
uh, for, like I said, for many years. And in 2018, just after I started talking about um, the issues around conflicts of rights between women's rights and trans rights and how we can resolve those conflicts of rights, um, and particularly looking at the law side and the uh, proposed reforms to the Gender Recognition Act. Um, I was scheduled to give a talk about the UN and human rights um, and cultural relativism, uh, where there were legitimate peaceful protests about me being on the campus. I wasn't talking about trans issues. I wasn't talking about women's rights. I was, I was simply talking about that topic. And, and everyone has a right to protest peacefully. Um, and there were, there, there were these peaceful protests on campus and, and some people came to the, to the lecture, uh, but it, it all went fine. And then I started noticing that I wasn't being invited back to a, a university that I had used to go to four or five times a year, maybe. Um, I was working with the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, who is an academic at the University of Essex. And I was helping him um, to write the first ever UN human rights report on anti-Semitism as a human rights abuse. Um, I did a lot of research. Um, my research assistant did a lot of research. We did a lot of data gathering with Jews from around the world. Um, and we helped him to, we supported him in his mandate to draft this, this report. And the report went to the UN General Assembly in 2019, in the autumn of 2019. Um, and for Holocaust Memorial Week, then in early 2020, the University of Essex wanted to showcase this report, and rightly so, because it was one of their academics who'd written it. And he said, yes, but Rosa helped support the mandate, so I'd like her to be on the panel. Fine. And uh, another uh, sociologist from Goldsmiths, who's an expert on anti-Semitism, um, had also been invited to be on this panel. I realised that that I, my invitation had been rescinded because, um, first of all, my colleague at Essex kept saying to me, have you received the, the formal invitation? I'd say, no, no, I haven't. Um, then my colleague in, in Goldsmith said, I've got all the detailed travel plans and what time we're meant to be there. So I, I wrote to them and I, I said, am I, am I now, you know, disinvited? Um, and they said, no, you were never actually invited. Uh, they said, um, you, you know, we put feelers out to see whether you might want to be on the panel, but we decided it would be better to have students. Um, and I thought, okay, that's interesting because I'd already had to do the whole, prior to all of this, and I think Joe's probably the same, um, no one ever had to put me through the external speaker policies. I was never sent an external speaker policy, which everyone's meant to be sent when they go and speak on a campus. No vice chancellor had ever been asked to approve of me speaking on a campus. But I, I knew, and it came out very clearly from Reindorf, uh, from the review, that the vice chancellor had already approved me. I had already gone through that process. You know, Rosa might be a terrible danger on campus. Can we approve her as an external speaker? And yet the formal invitation never came to me. Now, why would you go through that process of going through the external speaker process and policy, going all the way up to the VC, if it was just a feeler? So I wrote to my MP. My MP at that time was the university's minister. Um, I wrote to him and I said, um, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about this kind of cancel culture. I'm concerned about the blacklisting of academics. I'm concerned that I've been disinvited from talking on this topic, which is very close to my heart, my personal heart and my professional heart around Holocaust Memorial Week, around anti-Semitism, around human rights. And I'm, I'm probably one of the leading experts in my field on this topic. Um, and, um, and then I sent that letter to the Times newspaper. Because I, I realised that I just wasn't going to be invited and that they were, that, that, or I wasn't going to be platformed and that they were going to get away with it and that this event on anti-Semitism would go ahead without me. The Times newspaper ran the story and um, the University of Essex contacted me and said, oh, you know, we, we managed to make a little bit of room for you. Everyone's agreed to talk for five minutes less. Would you like to come and join this panel? I said, yes, absolutely, I would. Um, and the event went ahead and it was, you know, perfectly successful. Um, there were no protests. And again, the Rindorf Review made it clear, although lots of the parts have been redacted, that the, um, the people that would have liked to protest me decided that it might be a little bit in bad spirits to protest a Jew talking about anti-Semitism on Holocaust Memorial Day. And so, and so yeah, so I, unlike Joe, I did actually speak there, um, but only because I was three years or two and a half years into all of this and I realised that the only way I was going to get to speak there was if I actually made a, kicked up a bit of a storm about it. And uh, I mean, Joan, you know, talked a bit about the, the leaflet which formed the title of this webinar and you know, the, the kind of the verbal violence in there as well as the, the sort of the actual 
threats of violence. Um, but I mean, how did it make you feel to have a sort of an academic in a university um, engaging in that kind of behaviour on Twitter? I mean, I, I almost kind of don't want to repeat what was said because that itself just kind of feels inappropriate. But I mean, Joe talked about being you know, really angry and upset and I, I can only imagine what it I think, um, I think of, all the, you feel. of all the things that have happened um, over the last few years, I think the behaviour of a small group of academics on Twitter has in many ways been the worst because students look up to them. They see these academics who are so vile online about their peers, right? They might not call me a colleague. I might not call them a colleague. I don't think any of us are being very collegial to one another, but we are each other's peers. Um, if any of us who hold the views that we do, I, I call them radical feminist views, I don't call them gender critical, but if any of us who held these views behave like that online, we'd be up on disciplinaries. You know, we, we'd be taken to task. We have become this kind of punching bag and typically women involved in this, women academics have become this punching bag online. And then students see that and it legitimizes to them that they can treat us accordingly. And I think that's what spills over onto campus, both in terms of cancel culture, in terms of blacklisting, in terms of misogyny, in terms of aggression, violence. Um, and I think that those academics need to be held to account. Um, will they be? I doubt it. Um, but, but I was, I think the most appalled that I've been the most hurt that I've been was being compared with the Holocaust denier on Holocaust Memorial Day because I was invited to come and speak at the University of Essex about anti-Semitism. And, and it, it really distressed me. It distressed my family, it distressed my friends. Um, lots of the time, my friends and family don't get too involved with what goes on in, in this area of my life. But um, that that went, I will not say it went too far. It wasn't just it went too far. It was It was outrageous. And I think it's worth, you know, emphasizing. I mean, it was, it was clear in Joe's case that she was speaking specifically about the subject that a number of people objected to, rightly or wrongly. You know, um, in your case, Rosa, you we weren't speaking about issues related to, to trans identities or anything like that. You were you were speaking about something else, which is both obviously, you know, something very, you know, kind of personal and a kind of a lived experience for you, but also, uh, you know, crucially within your area of academic expertise. And, uh, you know, again, it, it's an extraordinary situation and, uh, you know, horrendous actually. Um, now, both both you and um, Joe have mentioned the, the Reindorf report and it's worth um, just pointing out that the, the university following these events um, commissioned an independent review uh, by Barrister Aqua Reindorf, I hope I pronounced her name correctly. Uh, and it's a very extensive report, although when I was re-looking at it yesterday, I was really struck by ha about half of the report, indeed all the stuff that's about the facts of the matter, were all redacted, at least in the public version. So trying to really understand what happened is difficult, and I can understand there were some sensitivities there. So just just to make clear, Joe and I received slightly unredacted versions of redacted. I mean, I didn't get the unredacted parts of Joe's or she of mine, but even the unredacted version to me still had huge amounts blacked out because they said it was other people's data. So I don't think anyone can make sense of this report fully other than the vice chancellor and uh, and Ms. Reindorf. Hmm. Well, let's, let's move on to just talking a bit about the Reindorf report itself. And uh, just a reminder to everyone, we've, we've, we've got a few questions and observations coming through on the Q&A. Um, one from Derek Young uh, related to how universities might manage these problems, you know, in the future. And we'll certainly, uh, we'll come back to talking about that shortly. Um, one from Sarah Paderson. Again, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, um, particularly reflecting on some of the points that Rose has just made. So if you um, have a look at those uh, in the Q&A, if you haven't had a chance, upvote them if you, if you think they're particularly uh, something that you'd like us to, to pick up on. And, and indeed, if you have questions or observations on your own, then please do uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, so let's move on to the, the Reindorf report. So as I said, there was a report that was commissioned by the university, by the Vice-Chancellor himself, I think, 
uh, which took quite a long time to come through. I think it was eventually published in about May of this year. Uh, and it found a number of things, uh, which I think are, are quite striking. I don't know, Rosa, would you like to kick us off with your sort of kind of reflections on what the report found in relation to, you know, your experiences and, and, and things that you felt were particularly striking about it? So I, I, I just want to start with this, that Joe and I didn't know each other. We knew of one another. Um, we were thrown together in, in, in this. Um, and we were thrown together in a way that was particularly appalling by Essex. They, they told me that um, they were going to tack my cancellation or sort of cancellation onto Joe's in this Rhinebook review. And then, you know, a year and a bit later, um, I come out of the Jewish festival to an email that says, uh, we've published this report and this apology, right? They didn't, they didn't tell me in advance that they were going to do this. We've done all this publicly. And I checked my Twitter and I checked my phone and, um, and it's been talked about really widely. Um, and there was no advanced knowledge. There was no advanced warning. There was no question to me of, you know, might this be an appropriate day to do it on, given that, you know, it was about anti-Semitism and it's a Jewish festival. Um, and I was having major eye surgery that week. And um, Jo will, will talk in a similar way, but she was she was in, in an even worse position at that time. Um, we, we spoke to one another and, um, and the vice chancellor sort of offered to speak to us individually. I think we both had about an hour on the phone with him. Um, he just he just suffered a, a personal bereavement, uh, but he, want, he felt it was really important to talk to us. And he assured us, or assured me, that this was just the first step and how deeply sorry he was and how he realizes a huge impact on me and he wanted to know all about my feelings and he wanted to know all sorts of things about, about me. And I thought, okay, this man is acting in good faith. Um, so every time I spoke about the Reindorf review initially, I would say, well, at least the University of Essex has done this review. At least they've taken this issue seriously enough to do a review and then to be implementing recommendations. Um, I shouldn't have taken him <laughs> as, as acting in good faith because it became very clear very quickly that um, he was going to do nothing around the recommendations and that the apology was not a first step, it was a last step, and that the apology really was not, um, was, was, was trying to paper over some cracks. Um, he then caved very quickly to pressure within the university, or maybe he himself always always knew that he was going to do this and he apologized for apologizing to us. Um, and since then the University of Essex has done absolutely nothing to remedy the wrongs that it's caused. But each time that they do things like apologizing, it takes up weeks of my life because I get a series of emails, I get a series of tweets. Um, it reignites the people that want to send me abusive messages. It reignites the death threats on, 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 that, that come through either on, on email or on other forms of social media. Um, then he apologizes for apologizing and that happens again. It, it creates this kind of media storm and it creates this Twitter storm um, and it makes students um, think that I'm a legitimate target for attack. Um, Essex University has repeatedly written to us and said um, that they want to publish our personal data because they've had hundreds of FOI, Freedom of Information Act requests about the report and they just want to publish an unredacted version of it. And we repeatedly say, no, we don't consent to this, but if, if they choose to do it, it's up to them. Um, Joe, do you, do you have some, some further thoughts also on the Reindorf report? Uh, yeah. specifically just building? Um, yes. And... For those who don't know, uh, the apology to me came fourfold, right? And uh, the, the circumstances Rosa uh, outlined, um, I, I was actually only five days out of hospital um, and uh, I didn't even know about, uh, you know, Rosa's events until two days after the Reindorf review was published. So, you know, when, when she says that we've been thrown in a bunker together, it's quite li literally, we've been thrown in a bunker together. So, on behalf of Essex University, uh, Anthony Forster uh, apologised for failing to plan adequately the seminar. Okay, well, that's a logistical error that can be made by anyone. Those are usually good faith errors. Um, and there you go. So, uh, on that one, I'm happy, you know, okay, fine, it happened. Uh, but then, uh, we failed to take immediate action in respect of the flyer circulated on the 5th. The flyer that has the title for this talk. I never, I mean, I kind of knew about it, but I actually didn't know 
how vile that poster was until the day that I read the Reindorf review. Um, and I just want to say, I have still never seen a copy of it. And I hope never to see a copy of it. Um, because, you know, when those things become personalized with your name on it, it creates a very different orientation to, to the issues at hand, if you know what I mean. Um, psychologically, if nothing else. Uh, and three, that they inappropriately asked me to provide a copy of my seminar for the purposes of vetting its contents. Yeah, I'm very pleased that they apologize for that. It's not inappropriate. It's bordering on unlawful, as we discover, because of the fourth thing that they apologize for, infringing my freedom of speech without justification by blacklisting me um, and uh, not inviting me to present uh, a future seminar. So I just want to say a few things. I want to double back on something, Richard, that you just said, uh, and I want to give you my views now, three months later, on Rheindorf and what I think is both its importance and what I think people are failing to understand about that, that report and the circumstances that happened to both Rosa and I. And the first thing I want to do, many of you, I've been looking at the attendees. Hello, everyone. Um, quite a few of you, uh, I imagine, have signed up to the British Society of Criminology. Um, and of course, if you've signed up to the British Society of Criminology, you will be familiar with our professional code of conduct. Now, our professional code of conduct binds us to put knowledge production first, right, and not to allow political interference of knowledge production. Uh, that's an important uh, fundamental precept. Uh, but it also talks, us, talks about actively promoting and encouraging professional development. It talks about not playing the work of others. It talks about not standing outside your discipline or outside your expertise and making critiques. So I'm just gonna come to Matt Lauder for a second. Matt Lauder is an historian. I suspect he's signed up to his professional body. I can't imagine for the life of me uh, that historians aren't bound by a similar set of ethics. So by that, uh, I want to come back to the Rheindorf and say one of the things that really strikes home to me now uh, is that academic freedom, of course, it has a legal framework around it and Rheindorf uh, set that out beautifully. Academic freedom is about pursuing uh, knowledge, being able to have debate, being able to have questions, uh, being able to act ethically and professionally. But it is limited by unlawful uh, language. And unlawful language is precisely harassment. Um, and for me, some of the events around what happened uh, at Essex, but also what's been happening over the summer since we launched the OU Gender Critical Research Network, uh, is harassment. Uh, it, it, it goes beyond academic freedom. These are insults, um, you know, particularly terms like, you know, turf, uh, things like that. But also just assuming that because we adopt a particular theoretical position uh, that uh, understands physiological sex, if you like, to have some significance, um, that that is ipso facto transphobic. Uh, now, that, that's, that's an academic problem, <laughs> and we need to talk about that. Um, but to simply hurl the insults seems to me to be both breaching the law, as set out in Reindorf, so very clearly. Um, I would encourage everybody to read her summation of the policy framework. But also, it's a breach of professional ethics in research, simply to try and bring people down because of their politics. And I just want to return to the 1980s and 1990s when I was young. Um, uh, there was Charles Murray. I don't know how many of you remember Charles Murray, the wonderful writer and originator of a particular version of a theory around black criminality that linked it to an underclass, um, which was horrendously racist. Um, now, what we didn't do was cancel him, what we did was went line by line through using the skills and techniques that we have to assess knowledge to challenge the fundamental precepts of what he was saying, um, to critique, 
uh, what he produced. And in critiquing it, it became a ludicrous piece of knowledge that nobody paid attention to. We did the same thing with many of the, um, what's often called male stream criminology, all of the assumptions about women in the criminal justice system. So looking back on Reindorf now, um, I, I sit there and think there's some very important things uh, in that review, uh, very helpful things about harassment, uh, public service duties that universities have, um, about uh, academic freedom, and I'm thankful for that. But what that review cannot do and has not done, and only arguably we can do, we meaning academics can do, is begin to understand better and really uh, uh, kind of get to grips with what is legitimate critique and what is not. Um, and the hurling of abusive um, assumptions at people uh, and shutting the space down is not, in my mind, professional academic behavior. Oh. Yeah, thank, thank you, Joe. Uh, and I think at this point, it might be worth just picking up on one of the questions in our Q&A from an anonymous attendee. And I think it's clear from, uh, from the question why they're anonymous. Um, I'm a PhD student. It seems to me that one reason women like Joe and Rosa have ended up so much in the firing line is that more junior academics have such precarious status that they keep quiet. Do you have any thoughts about how we might build strength in numbers, for example, how might early career researchers go about finding supervision mentorship for feminist projects? I feel very worried about how to find a postdoc job when I don't have to say where I don't have to where I won't have to stay silent to avoid alienating myself in any department. And she goes on, um, I, I don't know, if it's, I think it's a she, I'm not sure, um, maybe he, uh, goes on to, uh, to thank you both for the, the stand that you're taking. Uh, you know, so kind of really sort of, you know, kind of a worrying expression in the sense of, of anxiety from someone at the beginning of their academic career, but pointing maybe to some of the, the kind of institutional group thing and peer pressure, um, particularly affecting younger academics. I don't know, Rosa, whether you have any thoughts or reflections on that. I, my advice, even though I don't know who you are, anonymous attendee, um, would be until you are in your first permanent position, do not do something that will jeopardise you getting a permanent position. And it pains me to have to say that because that is not academia. It's not it's not the the higher education sector that I joined and um, and that I that I believe in. Um, but people will use any any excuse to make sure that people like us do not get jobs. Um, it was very clear from the Rindorf review um, that there were people that didn't want me to be interviewed for a job at the University of Essex. Um, there, there was actual questions about whether or not they should not shortlist me for a job for which I, I had met all the criteria because they were worried about protests of me even being interviewed. And I, I have a chair, um, I have a permanent position, but so, so if you are a PhD student or a postdoc or someone on a short-term contract in a precarious position, be aware of that. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't speak out. And there are PhD students that speak out and there are uh, people in junior positions that speak out, but just think about yourself and your career. And the fact that I've had to say that out loud shows just how much this group of people, and I think it's a small minority, um, just how much power they have on campus. Um, small minority of students and a small minority of academics. Um, in terms of what we can do about it, well, actually, what we can do is say, right, we're feminists, let's start putting out uh, funding bids that have PhD studentships attached for feminist projects. Come and seek out academics who you want to work with, whose um, research area aligns with yours and whose politics align with yours. Um, I think that there is, it's, it's not enough that people like Joe and I speak out, um, or, or the other academics. It's not enough that we write peer-reviewed articles um, in our field or give verbal and written evidence to government and things like that. We also need to make sure that there is space for PhD students and junior colleagues to come through and work with us. And I think it's been firefighting now for about three years and certainly around the stuff to do with Essex is just it's just constantly putting out fires um yeah every time I think I'm getting on top of my work Essex decides it's going to do something else and then you know the fires start but I think thinking strategically and thinking looking forwards um there is no onus on us as 
academics with permanent positions to be helping create that space for people like you, anonymous attendee, and for others coming through the ranks. I know that one of my former students I can see is on is on this call, and she's uh, I think starting her PhD very soon, and she's a she's an academic, and um, and she's great. And I know that she's come to events at the University of Reading, and it's great to see people who who care about this issue making their way forward in in academia. I'm not going to name her because I don't want um, anyone to target her. But um, yeah, I think we all have to work together on this, uh, but don't do anything that will jeopardize your career. Trust me, I, you know, I've got a great career um, and there are times when I regret speaking out. Thank you. Can I, can I just jump well, in? I, just before you do, Jill, because I was thinking that, you know, one of the things that, you know, has come out of all of this experience, you know, for you, but Rose is also involved in this, is the Open University Gender Critical Network. Okay. So just picking up on anonymous attendees question, I suppose, particularly that element about, you know, building strength in numbers. Um, I was wondering if you might just want to share some quick thoughts about that in addition, obviously, to anything else that you were just planning to say. Yeah, no, I was just going to jump in with the OUGCRN. So um, in rapid succession, just for people who are unaware, um, May the 18th, I think, or May the 17th was when the Randorf Review was published. Uh, and then like two weeks later, maybe three weeks later, we had uh, the Meyer Forstadter hearing. Um, there were a group of people, uh, colleagues of mine and I, at the Open University who had had similar experiences, uh, particularly John Pike and Laura McGrath, um, uh, of speaking out at union meetings, uh, of being kind of targeted for complaints because of signing letters against Stonewall and Times and the Guardian. Um, you know, and, and I just, sorry, I'm going to do a marginal comment here for a second. Um, being against Stonewall's policy is not transphobic. It's just questioning how an end, how an organization such as Stonewall envisages or sees what trans rights are. Um, and I have always been critical, well, I've been critical of Stonewall for a very long time. Anyway, that bracket off. Moving on, uh, because the Don and Laura and myself had been subject to particular types of treatment, as soon as the Meyer Forstadt ruling came out, in combination with the Rheindorf Review, we decided to contact people like Rosa, people like Kathleen, people like Alice Sullivan, Selena Todd, most, you know, the, the people who had been on the sharp end of this, and launch the Open University Gender Critical Research Network. The sole purpose of that is to help people like anonymous attendee. Uh, please contact me. You can find me, you know, through a very simple Google search at the Open University. Contact us through our Twitter handle at OU underscore GCN um, and uh, we can get you signed up to the network. We've now got somewhere around 90 people from across the globe. Uh, the point of that network is to make sure that a space is open to be able to develop this type of research. Um, that's one thing that I want to say. The other one is much shorter. Um, one of the most amazing things that's happened to me uh, from May through to the point that we launched the OU GCRN is recognizing how many people out there uh, are supportive. And when I say supportive, uh, what, I, what I mean is they may not share my political views. Uh, they may not share my theoretical perspectives, but they recognize that what's happening needs to stop and it needs to change. So, you know, thank you to the goodly folk at the Center for Crime and Justice Studies, because, you know, you are also part of the solution. We need to hold this space open. And I recognize quite a few names in the attendees list. Uh, thank you for coming, um, because I know, I know that we don't always share perspectives, but that's the point, isn't it, um, that we don't? and that we're able to talk across this. <laughs> uh, anonymous attendee, um, I agree with everything that Rose has just said, and I'd say seek us out. Come and find us, um, and you'll find a cohort of people willing and ready to help. And just on a sort of a practicality, bearing in mind um, Rose's uh, depressing, but I'm sure perfectly appropriate uh, uh, advice uh, to junior academics to broadly keep their heads down until they have a permanent position, um, or at least until they have a permanent position. Would if membership of the of the network, is that something that people can join on a kind of, as it were, softly, softly 
semi semi anonymous basis. Uh, more than that. So in the week in the week after we launched, um, I was flooded with emails, including from some extremely senior academics, the names of which would be known among this group, saying, "I really want to join your network, but you can't put my name anywhere." because if you do, I won't be able to do my job at my university. So we have kind of like three different lists, <laughs> you know, on this, uh, and it's all data protected and doubled down. And, you know, there's no way that anyone can get a hold of it, but we have a list of people who we will keep informed of the progress of the network and talk with that will never come out into the public domain. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, we're going to move on in a minute to talking about some of the broader issues around sort of academic freedom, um, research, um, academic ethics. And Joe's already um, highlighted some of those concerns. Before we do that, um, let's just pick up this question from Sarah Peterson. Uh, Peterson uh, I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced your name correctly. Um, and what Sarah says is Rosa has spoken about well, as well as thanking both Joe, Rosa and Joe. Rosa has spoken about writing to the Times and raising questions publicly. Um, this is something I've often dithered about, having been cancelled myself. Uh, and then, really, you know, do you are there some cancellations you publicise and others that you keep quiet about? And I'm sure anybody who's experienced any of this, this is probably a kind of a dilemma that they face uh, on and off quite a bit. So, Rosa, any any thoughts about that? Um, yes, I. I agree with you. There's there's some that I don't publicise. Um, I do a lot of work internationally. Um, this this issue has not affected my international work, my international reputation, my United Nations work, my human rights work. This issue has really only impacted my um, my my work within UK universities. Um, and there are sometimes that I don't publicise what's happened because I want to maybe protect a junior colleague who wants to invite me to something, realises that they're going to get an awful lot of uh, pushback for doing so. And yeah, I don't publicise necessarily that I've been invited to speak in schools on, on this topic or on, or, or on the topic of human rights generally. And then there's been pushback. And I, I, I do give assemblies at schools and do various things locally. Um, I, I don't publicise those ones because it's just going to cause those individuals or those schools an awful lot of pressure for people that are decent people who didn't realise that they were dipping their toe into some very, very murky waters. I publicised the anti-Semitism one because it mattered hugely to me on a personal and professional level. And I publicised it because I felt that the University of Essex had behaved appallingly. Um, so, yeah, there are different times. Um, you know, I do sometimes publicise death threats. I do sometimes publicise the, the violence um, that, 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 that I'm subjected to or perpetrated against me. And part of that is about naming uh, male violence for what it is. And part of that is a, a feminist decision that if we don't name the a problem, so for example, no one named sexual harassment. So sexual harassment just continued until the feminists came along and said, we need to name the problem. It's called sexual harassment and then we need to make it unlawful. Um, but I think it's, it's always about weighing up, um, weighing up in that particular circumstance, whether, whether it's the right thing to do. And, and Sarah, as you know, I'm a big fan of your work. And I think that you've behaved with great integrity and grace throughout everything that you've done. And um, sometimes I wish I had a bit more of your grace. Thank you, Rosa. Okay, let's let's move on to some of the broader sort of questions and implications um, of, of Rosa and uh, Rosa, your and Joe's experiences, um, particularly thinking about academic freedom. And um, Mary Corcoran, who's um, an established academic uh, in criminology, um, I think probably in that category of uh, permanent position, as it were. Um, to perhaps feels more free to talk about these things as well. Um, but Mary's put a, sorry, that's my, purely my speculation, I hasten to add. Um, Mary's put a question in the Q&A, which I think tees up quite well the, the question of academic freedom. And it's really in two parts. Um, she first of all asks about the quality of the terms of the debate uh, and uh, about academic arguments and counter arguments and how one, uh, you know, kind of copes with sort of the, the question of invective on the one hand, but also how one keeps open a space for rational public debate. Um, and then also uh, what, she, what Mary describes as the troubling opportunism 
of the libertarian right of the current freedom of speech universities bill so that the protection of academic freedom is not too far away from their culture wars agenda mm -hmm. um both kind of quite sort of complex questions are in right but joe do you want to have a go at maybe sort of answering uh, mary's questions as a way of getting ourselves into the Broader sure. academic yeah, no, absolutely. Hi, Mary. Thank you. Um, and in fact, the second part of your question it has been troubling me greatly over the course of the summer. And it kind of links into to the question that Sarah asked. At what point does one begin to publicize this stuff? And at what point does one engage uh, in politicking around this stuff, actual campaigning around this stuff? Um, so uh, I'm going to start with the first question. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, however we understand this notion of radical, but of a rational public sphere and rational discussion in the public sphere, yes, it's under critical strain. Uh, you know, Rosa and I and the issue around trans rights, sex-based rights, whatever you call this conflict um, is not the only conflict um you know we, we we see it all over the place from you know history and statues and and whatever else you know that the tories are um fomenting because some of this stuff is you know quite quite cynical i think uh without wanting to oh my goodness i thought that my um, notifications were off i apologize if you just heard that um yeah uh quite cynical um one of the, the telling things to me is that, of course, this, these issues might not have happened um, if it was uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But after the rise of, of political populism, um, and I'm really sorry, I can't turn this off and talk at the same time, so you might hear little clicks coming in, and I apologize for that. Um, yeah, one of the, the, the things that really strikes me is that the precondition for the closure of academic freedom uh, is precisely the sort of political populism that we've seen, you know, you know, since Trump got elected and just before, you know, the, the issuing of a you're bad um, sort of discussion. Uh, so I think there are some real issues around that. And of course, things like this can be used by the libertarians. And I'm really pleased you use the word libertarian um, there, Mary, because it's a really difficult path to tread you know, would I would I uh, say that there is no limit to academic freedom? No, I wouldn't. Um, so I'm not a libertarian in that regard. Would I say that there's no limit to freedom of speech or there should be no limit? No, I would not. What I would, however, say uh, is that within the bounds of lawful speech, and I would bracket off harassment as being unlawful speech, I would maintain the same uh, legal framework that we currently have. I might add a few more objective tests into it, um, but I'd maintain that. Um, but I think it can be used very, very cynically. Uh, now, the Freedom of um, uh, Speech Bill, the one that's going through Parliament at the moment, two big problems with it, right? Just leaving aside where we draw the lines and how these issues can be very cynically used in campaigning and, and how people like myself get caught up in that and have to constantly ask myself, am I sleeping with dogs? Am I going to wake up with fleas? Am I destroying my reputation? Um, do, do you know what I mean? And the, the constant reflection about that. Uh, the Freedom of Speech Bill just basically brings in a new audit, um, you know, that universities are going to be audited by. But it also fundamentally doesn't give people like Rosa and myself uh, much by way of, of, of remedial action. You know, you can't, external speakers can't take uh, a university to an employment tribunal. Um, so, yeah, I don't think the, um, yes, and indeed James Murray has put something there. Uh, uh, I don't think personally um, that uh, the way we solve this is simply by more law. I think more than anything else, senior scholars such as myself, such as Rosa, and indeed Mary, I'd encourage you, and Leo, and all of the rest of you that are here, we need to be taking a lead on changing the culture within universities. We have contracts that allow us to say no, no further, 
right? And we have the capacity, particularly for senior, to challenge some of the, let's just say, misbehaviors uh, that go on. Um, so I, I'm all for beginning to take responsibility uh, for university culture. It's not just us, but we can do something. Thank you, Joe. Um, there's a question in the Q and A, just asking for the details of the um, the gender critical network to be posted on on the chat. So, uh, one of my colleagues working behind the scenes might be able to do that. And if we can't do it in the course of this uh, of this webinar, we'll certainly we'll follow up with everybody anyway in an email. So we will certainly we can include the the, con the the details of that network in the follow up email. Um, Rosa, Joe mentioned James Murray's um, um, observation about the Academic Freedom Bill, or it's just disappeared off my screen, mm -hmm. it? Um, whether it would actually give more employment protection to academics. Um, Joe has a sort of a kind of a quite a critical view of the Academic Freedom Bill. I mean, do you want to kind of maybe offer your thoughts on that? But, you know, it, perhaps also just addressing specifically James's so for, so for anyone that doesn't know, James writes um, some excellent law blogs on this on this topic. It's worth um, googling him and, and reading some of his some of his insights um, from a kind of legal perspective. He's a proper lawyer. He's a, a practicing one, not like me. You know, um, I I also agree. I, I don't think law is going to solve this, um, and I think that the the crucial issue here is around how do we view the higher education sector. So my university has been excellent on academic freedom. Um, we have run many events um, on specifically on the conflict of rights, um, specifically on the reforms to the Gender Recognition Act. Uh, those events have been peacefully protested. The protesters sometimes come in and have a cup of coffee with us afterwards in a chat. Um, many other universities have not been good on, on upholding academic freedom. Now, my university is my employer, right? And if I'm invited to Essex, and then cancelled, I have no recourse currently in terms of employment law um, because they're not my employer or even under the new bill. Um, or the only real recourse that I have is to spend an awful lot of money on solicitors and um, and, and take a, a risky court case, you know, or defamation or breach of the Human Rights Act and things like that. Um, but we as a, as a higher education sector rely on external academics to do peer review, to do external examining, to do speaking engagements, to do um, sometimes even to do PhD supervision. So we have to stop thinking about this sector as I'm employed by my university and start thinking about we are all part of one sector and what kind of ombudsman or what kind of uh, tribunal or what kind of commissioner do we need for when academic freedom is breached by a different university? Um, and I don't think that, that this, this bill will address that. Um, I'm also not, I'm not hugely um, an academic freedom person. And my, my expertise is human rights. Um, human rights says that actually um, under the European Convention of Human Rights that you can have your freedom of expression limited where there is a public reason to do so. Um, so in Germany, the public reason to limit freedom of expression extends to not being able to buy Nazi memorabilia, even though you can buy that here, because there'll be different reasons in different countries. Um, so these absolutist freedom of speech people aren't necessarily the people who, um, who, who I would align myself with. Um, I'm, not, I'm not an absolutist freedom of speech person where it comes to what happens in America, and I don't particularly want to see that on campuses, but there is a big difference between... Um, legitimately restricting freedom of expression, right? In terms of not inciting racial hatred or things like that. And then canceling and silencing women whose views you don't like and who have a good enough evidence base and expertise that you can't argue with them about their views. And so instead what you do is what men have been doing throughout time. You put your hand over their mouth and you stop them from speaking. Thank you. Now, uh, one of the points you're you're kind of flagging up here, Rosa, is about the limits to free speech um, and what appropriate limits there may be. And, and in give different societies, there might be, uh, you know, rightly or wrongly, um, you know, different boundaries and limits that are set, you know, kind of in a general understanding. Um, but freedom of speech is also somewhat different from the notion of academic freedom. And I was just wondering whether you 
had some thoughts about you know what academic freedom is what is it and what is it not and uh, and, and joe it'd be good to hear your thoughts on that as well joe mentioned it earlier um but this idea of what's the purpose of academia um and she mentions it regularly and she so says, you know, we're, we're here to, to, to tackle societal issues. We're here to do, have knowledge production. We are here to debate and engage in order to move knowledge forward. Um, so I think academic freedom is the freedom for me as an academic to choose what I'll research on, right? It doesn't mean the freedom for me to behave however I want or anything like that. It's simply around what I'm going to research on and my area of expertise. Um, I, I don't um, talk about my opinions on this topic. I talk about my legal expertise on human rights as related to women and to trans people and resolving conflicts of rights. And sometimes I'm asked my opinions on other things, on prisons or on children or on medicine. And I say that my opinion is worth as much as anyone else's opinion, as much or as little as anyone else, it's an opinion. But what I can bring to the table is my expertise on law and on human rights. Um, and I think that the, the biggest, the biggest concern for me around academic freedom in this, it's not my freedom to speak anywhere I want to speak, right? But it is certainly my freedom to speak at an event that I've been invited to. But um, this no debate stance that is taken, that Stonewall created this hashtag no debate. Um, this idea of no debate goes completely against academic freedom. I'm not debating whether trans people exist. Of course they exist. I'm not debating whether they should have rights because I believe everyone has rights by virtue of being born human. I'm debating what's going on in law and whether or not there needs to be reforms to the law. That is my job. And yet on this topic, we are being told, no, you don't have academic freedom and yes, you must be silent. And, and uh, I'm gonna add one more thing here, which is, I, I constantly am told on Twitter or read on Twitter that how can I be being silenced if I'm in mainstream media, right? Now, I'm in the mainstream media all the time talking about Haiti, talking about the United Nations, talking about peacekeeping, right? Um, I'm also in the mainstream media because the mainstream media is covering the issues around the cancellations or the violence or the threats and things like that that, that are perpetrated against me and other academics but I'm being silenced in terms of my job, right? And they, and, they, and they kind of miss the point here. They say, well, you're not being silenced because look, you're in the Sunday Times, yes. But equally over the entirety of COVID when it's been so easy to invite people to give seminars on Zoom, I've been giving seminars in universities around the world including Pakistan and Australia and places like that but not once been invited actually once to, to, a, 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 to a, business, a business school in Leicester but not once been invited in the UK. Why? Because I've spoken out on this issue. So, so yeah, I think, and that is violating my academic freedom. It's telling me that unless I shut up on this topic, right, I'm not going to be allowed to speak on any of my expertise. Sorry, over to you, Joe. I think that's also, um, just, I mean, that's also a kind of a, a problem for academia more broadly, because if you're being effectively boycotted because of your position in relation to gender, uh, then it means to sort of academics from very senior academics through to early career researchers and undergraduates aren't benefiting from your knowledge in terms of law, uh, you know, glo global development and all those kinds of issues. So it's a kind of a bit of a, um, yeah, an own goal in that sense, isn't it? It is. And, and I think that we will never know how many seminars we weren't invited to give. We will never know how many funding bids we would have otherwise got. We will never know how many articles, um, because even if articles are, are double blind, peer reviewed, um, people often know from the start of writing, you know, how many articles weren't accepted. These things are unquantifiable. Um, and people will say, oh, you're so arrogant, Rosa. Why do you think that you would have got that funding bid or given those seminars? or being invited to anything. Well, this is why I know. I finished my PhD in 2011. I became a professor in 2016. I sit on the UN Secretary General's Civil Society Advisory Board on preventing sexual exploitation and abuse. I am super successful and super good at what I do. And so I know that I would have been invited to those seminars or got those funding bids or everything else, because in a very short period of time in my career, I managed to do all those things and then some. Uh, so it's not arrogance, it's knowing that I'm very good at what I do. Um, I also 
not very good at lots of other things, can't bake a cake, can't bang an nail into the wall, all sorts of life things, but I'm very good at what I do. Um, and it's unquantifiable. And I think that the impact will carry on for many, many years. And so how many students won't get the opportunity to talk with me or listen to me giving a guest lecture on the United Nations and the inner workings of it. How many conferences won't have my expertise on the UN Human Rights Council, which I'm the leading expert in the world on? It, it's not just the impact on me, it's also the impact on knowledge production and academia generally. So yeah, I, I agree with you. And sorry if that sounded arrogant. No, I mean, from PhD to professor in five years is a, is a pretty, impressive, uh, uh, pretty impressive trajectory. Um, Joe, just sort of again picking up on this academic freedom uh, uh, theme, and you know, kind of maybe sort of trying to pose the question sharply. I mean, as a criminology professor with established expertise, just as, as Joe has established expertise in in her areas, um, is your is your right to academic freedom, if that's the right way of framing it, is it um, is it qualified by your areas of expertise? Because sometimes one of the criticisms of those who are engaging, let's say, in questions of gender is, well, yeah, but you haven't read the literature. Uh, you know, you don't know. So why don't you stick in your lane and stay in your lane in relation to your areas of expertise and leave it to the queer theorists or the gender theorists to have that discussion about gender? So what's your, your answer to that? Is, is academic freedom, is it, is it boundaried by the specific expertise of a, of a given academic? No, no, but yes. <laughs> right. So here's here's the, um, it may not be a terribly short one, but I'll try and keep it short. Okay, so academic freedom to me, I hear academic freedom and I translate it in my head to professional ethics, right? Um, and I translate it in my head to professional ethics because I have a particular view, which I think is right, about what it is that we do when we produce knowledge. Uh, when we produce knowledge, we ask questions. We're not going out discovering what we already know. Right? That's ideology. What we're trying to do is understand and produce something new. Now, we have lots of different ways of doing that. We can do it theoretically. We can do it through critique of extant knowledge. Uh, we can do it through you know, the collection of empirical evidence. Uh, we can do it at a subject-specific level. So there's lots of ways to produce knowledge. But the production of knowledge always starts with the fact that you cannot club the questions that you ask. So all questions must be possible to be asked, particularly in the social sciences. Now, that being said, most of us, by the time we get past our PhDs, are familiar with literature far beyond our actual substantive empirical topic. I'm not an empiricist. So I have spent 23, nearly 24 years being interested in concepts of sex, gender, sexuality, identities, policy, policy reform, governance, governmentality, risk. So I, I know a lot about a broad range of literature uh, and that's not being arrogant. That's just what happens after 23 years. So um, that, that whole issue of, am I speaking outside my lane when I critique Stonewall, for instance? Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not speaking outside my lane because part of what I do is understand the unintended consequences of policy reform. Um, part of what I do is understanding the link between politicking with an ING and knowledge production. I understand that how we conceive of the world ultimately shapes what we then think the problem is, which ultimately then shapes what we ought to do about it. So is my academic freedom constrained only to my specific empirical expertise? Absolutely not. My academic freedom is constrained by the extent to which I have been taught how to critique and how to think. Um, so, you know, what it is constrained by is just shouting at politics. Do you know what I mean? I don't think you know, I'm a lifelong feminist here in one way or another. I've, I've, I've done stuff on women and girls forever, it feels like. Um, you know, and yet I don't think calling a piece of research sexist is an academic critique, right? Because that's about politics. Um, anyway, I think that, does that answer the question, Richard? <laughs> I feel like a PhD student now. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 I think absolutely. And I think it's, it's kind of an important, uh, you know, um, qualification that we've been exploring about, 
limits yeah. freedom of speech, limits to academic freedom and, and what's implied by that. Um, we're quickly running out of time, uh, but I can did I, want to Can I, can oh, I jump sorry. in one, one, one thing to follow up on, on, on what Joe's saying, but also just to follow up on, on what you asked. Um, why should we say that um, any topic is limited to, you have to stay in your lane, right? So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, I'm a law professor, I work in the areas of development studies, I work in the areas of international relations, I adopt feminist theory in my approaches. Why should it be left to gender studies departments or to queer theorists? Why can't I bring my expertise? Because I don't think any discipline is single disciplinary. Um, some people might adopt more of a doctrinal approach to law. Lots of people adopt socio-legal. Uh, lots of people adopt different different lenses to look at. And this, this idea of staying in your lane is only ever told to women on this topic, right? And I just think we have to recognize this for what it is. It is vile misogyny, right? If people were saying, okay, stay in your lane, Friedman, don't talk about international relations, don't talk about international development, don't talk about all these other things that I work on. Um, and therefore also now don't talk about this topic. Then I think, okay, I mean, they're a bit strange, but you know, they, they really care about single disciplinary angles but it's not it's only on this topic and it really is only to women and it is misogyny pretty clear <laughs> <laughs> okay let's let's move on to the final part of the discussion which is really just trying to put this in the sort of wider context of, of society and uh, you know public knowledge and public debate and I want to just start this by picking up on a question by um, by Jeff um, who asks um, if there is a time perhaps to comment on the role of the mainstream media and its own ethics, especially, I'm sorry, it's just disappeared from my screen again. This is one of the problems with these things that once something gets upvoted, everything um, changes. Here we go. The role of mainstream media and its own ethics, especially their often bad faith around the trans controversy and selective reporting and editing of controversial issues because they can also feed into cancel culture. And there was a kind of, a, there's a rather notorious example in the last few days, um, in the Guardian newspaper sort of retrospectively editing a, an interview with, uh, with, with Judith Butler. Um, so I don't know if, if either of you want to maybe kick us off uh, with a bit of a discussion uh, about uh, the, the broader public debate, perhaps starting with, with media and ethics and the risk of asking you to move outside your lane again, Joe. I don't know if you'd like to. Yeah, uh, so Ro Rosa, uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we, never, we never knew each other before all of this. And indeed, until a couple of weeks ago, last week, uh, Julie Bindle's book launch, we never actually met. Um, what I learned very quickly is that Rosa had a lot more understanding of how the media works than I do. Um, and, you know, my fingers got burnt once or twice. Uh, I think it's not so much bad faith. The media exists to sell media. That's what it does. Um, you know, it's not there. I mean, particularly newspapers, you know, we used to say it's there to sell newsprint. And, you know, certainly as a criminologist, I've spent ages talking to undergraduate students about newsworthiness and news value and the, the creation of, you know, kind of moral panics and, you know, folk devils and, and all of this. And the media's role in, 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 in promulgating particular ideas about the problem of crime, et cetera, et cetera. And yet I singularly failed to be able to turn that critical lens on myself um, and understand that I was becoming part of something that actually exists on its own over there. Um, and so the only thing that I'd say is, yeah, even people like us have to treat the media with a little bit. And, and here I'm talking particularly about news, news media uh, a, with, with a real uh, hint of caution. Um, that's all I want to say because, you know, it's outside my lane. <laughs> This. I mean, in relation to news media, and, and Rosa, you were given a good introduction there. I mean, in a sense, your attempted cancellation deplatforming uh, probably was only um, rethought because you went to the media in your MP. So, so, so bearing in mind that I, 
this is in my lane, right? So um, when I was helping uh, the organization that was trying to resolve the Haiti cholera claims against the United Nations, the UN brought cholera into Haiti and then never bothered to clear it up or to remedy. We used the media as one of our strategies. We used diplomacy as one of our strategies. We used all sorts of different avenues in. So I, I did have a greater understanding of the media than Joe, but it's very different using the media and being used by the media. And there are certain journalists like Julie Bindle, who I will always trust if she wants to write something up because she cares about the issue and because she cares about the individuals. Um, many of the journalists just want to sell newspapers and um, clickbait, you know, I, uh, I had it recently, I tweeted something, the Daily Mail picked up on my tweet, wrote an article, used some photos that they bought from two years ago, from a photo shoot two years ago that were on Shutterstock. And everyone said to me, why did you give them an interview? I said, I didn't. They can write whatever they want. It was clickbait. And they, they'd seen a tweet of mine and they, and they wrote a story. Um, there are other journalists that I have worked with in the past, but that I think have behaved not so ethically recently around certain stories. Um, I think the media focuses hugely on this issue, and I'm not sure why. Um, I don't just mean on academic freedom. Um, the media does an awful lot of reporting around sex and gender identity. Um, there's far greater scrutiny of it from both sides um, than proportionately there ought to be compared with other very serious issues that are occurring in this country, like massive amounts of child poverty, like the housing crisis, like irregular migration, um, all sorts of things. Um, I think that the reporting on both sides um, goes along with the politics of the different media outlets. Um, I think, that, like I said, I think there are some very good journalists with very good ethics and integrity, but I think that probably a lot of the stories that are written are non-stories, but they're clickbait, and people know that they will get retweeted, that they will sell the newspapers, that there'll be big advertising on them, because there is a small part of Twitter where every single thing that's written about this, from whatever angle, gets unpacked and analysed endlessly, um, goes onto Mum's Net, which produces people to click on the link, and therefore, as Joe says, sell the stories. Thank you. Um, right, we have time for just one last sort of um, bit of reflection, really, which is about, um, you know, where where does this leave universities in the future? You know, what are the what are the challenges? So we we've talked a lot about the Essex situation, but it's not just um, Essex where this has been a problem. And Derek Young in the Q and A has uh, has some suggestions. Uh, about how universities might handle these better in the future. A lot of it to just do with kind of being clear that no one has a right to be offended, not to be offended, or to dictate the limits of speech or thought for others. So just in the two or three minutes we have left, um, Rosa, Joe, maybe starting with Joe, uh, just some thoughts on, uh, you know, how universities can uh, can handle these situations better in the future. Yeah, uh, I think the very, very, very first thing they have to do is recognise that as the, the university management needs to recognize that their, um, their role is not just to not intervene, right? You know, harm on both sides sort of thing, um, but rather their role is to act and to act very specifically to defend their, you know, to defend academic freedom. Um, you know, uh, Reading and I don't know if we have time, but Reading does it beautifully well. From what I understand, you know, there are protests, uh, but when there are protests, protesters get tea and coffee as well. So it's you know a kind of well, well trodden path to be able to do that. Uh, that's one thing uh, that absolutely critically needs to be done. But I think you know, and, and I'm going to say this because I feel like I'm a million years old. It's time that we, as an academic community, and I'm going to bang this drum every single time recognize that we are the university, right? There is management of the university and that makes our conditions difficult and we have to navigate those, but we make the culture. Uh, and so when we start clubbing our knowledge because of political perspectives, or when we start asking our senior uh, academics to stop talking, then we are betraying not only our professional ethics, we're betraying our profession and we are taking our universities into places that you know fundamentally breach what a university should be for. And final comment, there are many things that offend me, uh, many things, sexism offends me, racism offends me, transphobia offends me, um, but also poverty offends me, 
um, reading some of the stuff that I read about the treatment of women and children in the criminal justice system offends me greatly. Part of knowledge production is precisely walking into places where it's difficult, challenging, and indeed offensive. Um, yeah, right. I, agree, I, agree with, I agree with everything Joe just said, um, particularly with the university and particularly some of the research and work that I do um, means that I read about the horrors, the worst human rights abuses. I meet with survivors of the worst human rights abuses. Yes, of course, that deeply offends me, but I need to do it in order to produce knowledge, in order to hopefully help in a tiny way towards better protecting human rights. I think something that's crucial that university management will need to address in the coming years is the huge impact on the well-being and mental health and working conditions of the of the of the ways in which academics like Joe or like I have been treated, have been treated by other universities, sometimes have been treated within our own universities, have been treated by students, have been treated by anonymous members of the public. Um, at the end at the end of the day we are human beings and we are employees and we need to be protected in our workplace and i know i don't just mean protected by security guards i mean protected in my workplace even at home in terms of my well-being in terms of my ability to do my job protected in terms of my time because every email that comes in every request for immediate interview every email coming that's supportive or that's a death threat takes up my time that should be spent on my work and I think that while my university has been incredible on academic freedom, um, my head of school has been, my vice chancellor has been, and everyone in the middle, um, there are no processes really in place in any of these universities for what to do when students are harassing academics. There are processes about what happens if academics behave badly towards students. There aren't processes in place about what to do when there are many, many anonymous complaints or external complaints about an academic. Um, the, I know, I know of other academics in, in similar situations, not just in the UK, but in, you know, around the world, that um, where HR sort of got in touch with them and said, we are not really going to be investigated for this, but we've had so many complaints about you that we have to be seen to do something. Management has to change. Management has to change its view towards us. We are not the aggressors. We are their employees. And I think that... You know, alongside the academic freedom protections and the new bill and all things like that um, needs to be this kind of awareness. And, and I say that as I sit here and think, you know, just the huge impacts on my mental health, on Joe's mental health, on our physical health. Um, and, and again, there's no there's no recourse to remedy for, for any of that. Thank you, Rosa, and thank you, Joe. Um, we're out of time. Uh, Morag MacDonald in the Q&A says, thank you both. It has been a joy to listen to informed and considered arguments and for sharing your experience with Essex University. I don't think I could have put that better myself. So thank you, Morag, for that comment. And thank you for all our, for all our attendees, all who've commented and all who uh, donated when they, when they registered. Uh, it's really important. I mean, you know, we do these, we don't charge for these events, but your financial support to help us run them um, is, is always really valued. Um, looking forward later this month, our next webinar is, is, is the first of a new series of webinars we're holding called Lunch With, um, and we will be having lunch with Francis Crook, the outgoing chief exec of the Howard League, uh, later uh, this month, towards the end of September. And another one just really for your diaries, um, we're going to be holding in late October uh, an event with Women's Place UK on um, the question of women's imprisonment. And uh, Joe Phoenix is, is going to be one of our speakers at that event in late October. Uh, so all the details will be on our website and we'll also we can follow up with, with, with email notification um, as and when. So for now, all I can say is thank you very much, uh, Joe and Rosa, for really some fabulous and considered uh, and reflective thoughts on a very difficult and dare I say possibly quite traumatic period in both your lives mm. and uh, and I'd like to thank all our participants for attending uh, this will all be on the YouTube fairly shortly and uh, I look forward to seeing you at uh, future events thank you <laughs>